The stories you are about to hear are intended for entertainment purposes only. Please do not try any of these games at home. Not only do you run the risk of very real world accidents, you could unwittingly open a door to something far more insidious. Bravery, honour and loyalty. These are the most important attributes that a samurai must possess. A role that would see them literally fall on their own swords if they failed was not any place for the mentally weak. Not knowing what could come their way at any time, it was important for the samurai to not just be brave in the face of their enemies, but to also be in control of their own existential fears, and even be stoic in the face of threats from other places. Darker places. Places that don't always seem to be present in our world, but are there, just beyond the shadows, just beyond the veil of our reality. It was in 1660 that the first recorded incident of this game being played took place. A group of young samurai gathered late one night with the intention of facing their ultimate fears. The group placed the mirror on a table before surrounding it with candles, slowly taking it in turns to light 100 of the candles. They then retreated to another room and sat in a circle. It would take the bravest of them all to start the ritual. The first man stood up and began to tell a story, a terrifying story of the demons that live in the darkness. The group hung on his every word as he spoke in this darkened room. When he had finished the story, the man went to the room where the candles were lit, looked deep into the mirror and blew out one candle. He remained there in silence for several minutes before rejoining the group. This practice continued long into the night. Each man would take it in turns to tell stories of the strange and the unsettling, the intention being to strike fear in the minds of their companions. One by one, after each story, the teller would head into the candlelit room, look into the mirror, and blow out a candle. Hours passed. You can only imagine what was racing through the minds of the young samurai at this point. Their imaginations ablaze with tales of the impossible. And with each tale that passed into their ears, the candlelit room would get darker and darker. Over the years, many who have played this game claim to have experienced hallucinations throughout, growing more and more vivid as the room grows darker. But it is the final storyteller who really seems to be at the most risk. After the hundredth story was told, the last samurai walked into the room. The mirror, now lit by a single candle, flickering in the pre-dawn breeze. It's hard not to imagine he would have hesitated before blowing out that candle and being plunged into complete darkness. What happens after this final step of the game is unknown. Very few have completed the process and the ones that have normally don't like to talk about it. Blowing out that final candle is a step into the unknown. A place where the darkness is all encompassing, and the things that live in the darkness have free reign. We call these games, but really they can be seen as rituals. Throughout history, Ritual magic has been used by those on the fringes of society to supposedly achieve their heart's desires, or to peek behind the apparent illusion that is our reality. These rituals are not just artifacts of history though, they have grown, evolved over time. Many make use of modern advancements in technology, and with the prevalence of the internet, tales of these ritualistic games have spread faster and faster. This game, like the remaining ones in this episode, is one you must play on your own. Not that you should, and let me be very clear about this, play any of these games at all. You will need a building with an elevator, and at least 10 floors. The order in which you perform the actions is very important. One slight discrepancy will either make the ritual fail, or worse, create an undesired outcome. The player enters the elevator on the ground floor, 
The sequence you visit the floors is very important. Do not forget it. First, push the button and go to the fourth floor. When the elevator arrives there, do not get off. It is very important that you stay in the elevator until the first part of the ritual is complete. Then, head to the second floor. Then the sixth. Then the second again. Then the tenth. And then the fifth floor. If anyone else gets into the elevator at any point, the ritual has failed. In this case, you should return to the ground floor immediately and leave the building without looking back. The player should not attempt the game in this specific building ever again. There is one exception to this rule. On the fifth floor, a lone woman may enter the lift. She will not leave. Whatever you do, do not look at her and do not talk to her. She is not what she appears to be. While this woman is a sign that the player is performing the ritual correctly, the danger they are in has ramped up considerably, and it is very important they follow all instructions to the letter. Now, press the button for the first floor. If the elevator goes to the first floor, then the ritual has failed. Leave the elevator immediately, and do not look back at the woman. Again, do not return and attempt this ritual again within this building. However, if the lift strangely starts heading up to the 10th floor, the game is working. The player is now being taken somewhere else. Somewhere few have ever seen. When the door opens at the 10th floor, look out the door and make sure the coast is clear. If everything seems quiet, then you can get out and explore. If the woman from the 5th floor is still there, she may ask you where you are going. Do not answer her just leave the elevator. The tenth floor may appear normal to begin with, but small details about it will not be right. Most or all of the lights will be out. It's important that the player keeps a track of where they are going. Time and space seem to move differently on this floor. Small details about the layout may change, but if you recall the directions back to the elevator, you should be able to find it again. It's very important that the player finds the same elevator they arrived in when it's time to leave. This strange reality that the player has entered isn't just confined to the 10th floor. If you approach one of the windows, you will look out onto a pitch black world. The only light produced by distant strikes of lightning. But it is enough to illuminate what many people have claimed to see in this world. There, in the darkness, stands a giant red cross the player should feel free to explore further, but just remember where you are, and try not to get lost. When you're ready to return to your world, find the elevator and return to all the floors in the same sequence you did before. The woman will likely be in the elevator with you still. Again, do not look at her, do not talk to her. Finally, push the button for the ground floor to return. If the elevator tries to return to the 10th floor again at this point, then it's important the player interrupts this by selecting another floor on the way up. Do not let it return to the 10th floor. If this happens, repeat the sequence as many times as needed to return to the ground floor. Once the doors open on the ground floor, it's important that the player takes a minute to look at their surroundings before leaving. Make sure there is nothing out of place. If everything looks normal, then you can leave the elevator. Again, even if you hear the door shut behind you, do not look back. She could still be there, waiting for you. Leave the building as quickly as you can. Now is the time to congratulate yourself. You have survived the elevator game. I would not recommend that you take that gamble again. Many ritual games are just designed to let us peek into another world but some can help us in this existence. These games are said to provide us with the things we most desire, but they will always come at a cost. And in this next example, that cost is a simple journey, a journey that I do not recommend you ever take. The risk is certainly not worth the reward. It's time to think of a wish. This can't just be any old wish. This needs to be your ultimate wish. Look deep inside yourself and think. 
What do you truly desire in life? It needs to be something you're committed to. Because the journey in front of you is not going to be a pleasant one. It's important you keep this wish at the forefront of your mind throughout this journey. It needs to be your sole focus. Wait until nightfall. Get a vehicle. I suggest using a car if you can, but nothing too conspicuous. You don't want to draw any more attention to yourself than necessary. Other vehicles will work, but something like a motorbike will leave you more exposed. Make sure you wrap up very warm, regardless of the weather. First, you need to start driving and find the road. This might sound vague, but you'll know it when you see it. It'll be a road you've never seen before. A road with no one else on it. A road that you should have passed many times throughout your life, but somehow never noticed. You'll spot some irregularities when you find the road, or an unexpected spike in your emotions. This road will be surrounded on both sides by deep tree lines. Once you find the road, close all your windows, turn off the radio, and start to drive down it. Whatever you do, do not stop. Your journey is about to begin. This first mile is your last chance. Any lingering doubts you may have about this ritual, now is your chance to stop it. Once you pass the first mile of your journey, there is no going back until the ritual is complete. On the second mile, you will start to notice the cold. Regardless of the weather, this cold will cut through you like a knife, getting worse and worse with each passing mile. The road ahead will be bumpy, with increasingly tight turns the further you go. Be very careful. If your vehicle becomes damaged by the poor road and can't go any further, there is no going back. You will slowly freeze to death in your car. Three miles in now, and you'll start to see them. Silhouettes of people in the trees, just in the peripheral of your vision. Do not look at them. Do not acknowledge them. If the fear is starting to creep in, it's too late to do anything about it now. Turning around won't do you any good. You won't find a way out of here until it's over. On mile four, you may begin to hear the figures in the woods. At this point, their voices will be distant. You aren't hearing them with your ears. It's like a bunch of whispers in the back of your mind. Do whatever you can to distract yourself from these whispers. Paying attention to them will just encourage them to come closer. On the fifth mile, the voices will leave you for a moment as you enter a clearing with a seemingly endless lake and a blindingly bright full moon. Do not look at the moon. It's a trap. Stay focused on the road and keep driving. The sixth mile will bring you darkness. The road disappears back into the trees that are now growing so thick they block out all light from the stars above. Your headlights may start to dim here. Pray that they stay working for the duration of your journey. Those voices I mentioned earlier, they aren't done with you. Without warning, your radio will switch on at full volume, emitting a horrific screeching sound. They are trying to scare you so you have an accident. Stay focused. After the sound, you'll start to hear a voice on the radio. It'll tease you, mock you, play on your deepest and darkest fears. Again, do not focus on it. The more attention you give the voice, the stronger it becomes. Focus on the road. You won't be able to turn the radio off. This is your challenge, and at this point, you have no choice but to conquer it. The seventh mile will see the return of the figures in the trees. Only this time, they are much clearer. These are said to be the people who have taken the journey and failed, left to haunt the road for all eternity and drag others into their personal hell. You may hear their voices a lot closer now. You'll hear screams and yells coming from them. It may even sound like one is coming from the back seat. Whatever you do, do not turn around. Watch the road. Looking at one of the beams directly will be the end of you. Mile 8. 
the figures will become more persistent. You will hear them yelling, clawing at the car, climbing on top. As long as you don't stop, they can't get to you. And the road is very dangerous from this point on. So whatever you do, don't look away from the road. The cold will almost be unbearable at this point, but there's nothing you can do about it. Just keep driving. At some unexpected point on mile 9, your vehicle will stall. The beings from the woods will be surrounding you now, screaming in your mind, torturing you with their voices. There will be hundreds. The sounds will make it impossible to have any rational thoughts. As soon as the car stops, close your eyes so you can't see them. Restart your car as quickly as you can and drive. Once you reach mile 10, they will slowly retreat back to the trees, watching you as you continue your journey. Mile 11. You're nearly there. But this is when control will be taken away from you. The car will lose all power again, but it won't stop. Instead, you'll be gliding down the road in pure darkness. Eventually, you will see a red light in the distance. This is your cue to cover your eyes. Whatever you do, do not look at the red light as you approach it. You will soon enter the red light. I cannot stress this enough. Do not open your eyes. You will hear screaming. Scream so painful you can't stand it. The crippling cold will turn to extreme heat. You will feel like the vehicle is cooking, that it's falling apart in a ball of flames. You will think your skin is peeling off your bones. It's not. Keep your eyes closed and hope that it will end soon. You only have 31 seconds of this torment to get through, but most do not manage it. Just as quickly as it started, you will feel everything vanish. The cold will return. The power of your vehicle will be back on. Open your eyes and you will be back on the road. Drive for a few more seconds and you will reach a dead end. Stop the car and sit there. Close your eyes and think carefully in your mind about your wish again. Picture it as vividly as you can. Then slowly open your eyes. You will find yourself back at the start of the road. Now, some say that if your wish was a physical item, you can get out and look in the back of your car and it will be there waiting for you. But even now, I would not recommend leaving that vehicle. Instead, drive away and look when you get home. If the wish was something bigger, then it will come to you in time. If you do survive the 11 mile drive, you'll be left with a memento beyond just the thing you desired. Those who have made the full trip say that late at night, when they lay there struggling to sleep, they will hear the sounds from mile 10. Those screams of grief and pain, the sounds that will never leave you. The sounds that you might hear again in person one day. Our final game tonight also has the potential to provide you with a great reward. However, to do so, you'll be playing a game with an entity who doesn't lose often. For this game, you will need a large backyard, or ideally, a house with a large field. The times that you begin this game have an important outcome on what you will possibly gain, but you can start any time between 9pm and 11pm. You will need a crucifix, a candle, a lighter or matches, and an analog watch. You do not want to be relying on anything electrical here. Make sure you are alone in the house and light your candle. Keep the matches on you at all times. Head to the backyard and make sure you're facing the house. Then you will whisper seven times, who will keep the crows away? Who will keep the crows away? Who? will keep the crows away. 
Who will keep the crows away? 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 On the final repetition, listen carefully. If you hear nothing, he does not want to play with you. Accept this decision and leave the house until morning to be safe. But, if he does want to play, you might hear a voice. Some say they hear it whispered in their ear. Others say it can only be heard in your mind. But it will simply say, That's not your biggest problem. That's not your biggest problem. Immediately head inside your house and lock the door. You need to move quickly. Find a room, ideally one that is small without too many items in it. This room needs to only have one door. It'll be your safe room. Once inside, you need to make sure that anything that could be opened is shut. This could be bags, drawers, cupboards, boxes. Anything and everything that could be opened needs to be closed. Leave the crucifix in this room, but keep your candle on you. It's time to leave the room and begin your game with the man in the fields. Everything else in your house that could be opened will be open. You have until midnight to close them all. You need to move fast, but be thorough. If you miss even one item, this game will not end well for you. You may notice in the peripheries of your vision a man dressed in farmer's clothes with ashen skin. Ignore him. He is not here to harm you, merely to observe. The one thing you absolutely must not do is look out the window into your backyard. Because standing there, where there may not have been anything before, will be something that looks a bit like a scarecrow. But it isn't a scarecrow. This is the man in the fields. He will be waiting. He'll know the temptation to look down at him will be great. But looking at him will be seen as an invitation. Looking at the man in the fields will give him permission to enter your home and take your life from you. If you make a mistake and happen to glance at him, rush back to your safe room, grab your crucifix and wait. Hopefully, you'll still be alive come morning, but it isn't likely. Once you are certain you have closed every item in the house, there is only one thing left to do. Go to bed and close your eyes. Remember, you need to complete this before midnight. You likely won't be able to sleep, but no matter what you hear, no matter what you feel, do not open your eyes until morning. When you feel the morning sun on your eyelids, it's safe to open them. So what do you gain from playing the dangerous game with the man in the fields? Well, that depends on what time you started. If you began at 9pm, you'll be physically safe for one year. You will not become seriously injured or be ill. You will remain healthy for the full calendar year. If you started at 10pm, you will remain healthy, but also receive financial abundance for the entire year. If you started at 11pm, you are safe in all aspects of your life. No negativity can affect you for the entire year. But, after one year, these effects will start to diminish, and the bad luck that you have avoided can start to return to you tenfold. So, how are you going to stop that from happening? Well, I guess you're just going to have to spend another night with the man in the fields, won't you? I just want to credit the podcast Morbid for their spooky games that will ruin your life episodes. In the most recent one, they suggested the book Dangerous Games to Play in the Dark by Lucia Peters, as well as her website, The Ghost in My Machine, which were fantastic resources for this episode of the Tape Library. I'm sure you all already know it, but I'll leave a link to their podcast, as well as to the book in the description. If you're interested in creepypastas or rituals and sleepover games, 
It's the perfect little book to have. As always, if you've enjoyed this episode, then please subscribe and also be sure to like the video. It really helps us get these stories out to more people. That's all for now. Remember, do not play any of these games. But if you do, be sure not to lose. There are certain outcomes that are much worse than death. Pleasant dreams. <laughs>